Dobry večer. Wait. Hello. Hello. Yeah, this is Vaisya Linda Luisi Marcia Ostashevsky. I'm the director. Well, the director who stepped back from the Center for Sound Communities. I'm really pleased that the actor and director Shauna McDonald is here, a dear colleague and friend. Uh, the Center for Sound Communities is an art space research center at Cape Breton University. The center is working together with Holy Ghost Ukrainian Catholic Parish, where we are all gathered today, to host a festival that marks 110 years of the parish and 60 years of this very hall that we are in. Although the original hall was built in 1928, so it has a much longer history. Tonight's talk and then later concert help us to begin a whole first week of a festival that lasts six weeks. A festival of workshops and talks concerts, celebrating and sharing Ukrainian heritage. All of us here today are gathered we're from many different backgrounds and walks of life. We're gathered in Unamagi, part of Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral lands and unceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm a settler of Ukrainian ancestry. My family immigrated to Canada about a hundred years ago and established farms in the Western prairies in territories covered by Treaty 6. I began to visit and to work in Unamagi in 2008 in this very parish. They very warmly welcomed me here. And then in 2013, I was invited by Cape Breton University to move my family here for a study job. The lands on which we are gathered, the Magi, are covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Molostia people first signed with the British crown in 1725. I've heard my dear friend and colleague, Graham Marshall, who's a member to counselor, talk of how the Mi'kmaq are known to be great warriors. They did not lose a ba battle to Europeans and surrender their territories. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and waters, which are also important to them as a maritime people. The treaties recognize Mi'kmaq and Molostiev title and established rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. So it is with the Ukrainian parish community's efforts this anniversary year. Along with the festival, parish members are meeting with and learning from and sharing with local Mi'kmaq elders and knowledge holders. We're building mutually respectful and caring relationships with the hope of fostering meaningful reconciliation for generations to come. Those of us of Ukrainian ancestry are considering thoughtfully our relationship with this land and its first peoples. We invite you to join us tonight in all of the festival events in the coming six weeks and the gatherings where we will continue to share traditions and knowledge across cultures and communities and generations. Work with us toward a future building through mutual care and support where a place where we can all, all of us diverse peoples, live and work among one another with respect and care, peace and prosperity in Mi'kmaq. In Mi'kmaq. And I'd like to introduce now our first speaker in a series of talks that will happen over these six weeks. Every single talk will be over Zoom, projected here, as you can see on the TV as we are joined here today. And then some of your friends, maybe who can't be here in person or across the world somewhere, they can also sign in on Zoom. Um, so <clears throat> we're hoping that there's an audience. Uh, and then these, record, these talks will be recorded and posted on the Center for Sound Communities YouTube channel so that we can revisit um, the knowledge that is shared with us by these uh, esteemed speakers. The first is Dr. John Paul Himka, an American Canadian historian and professor emeritus in history at the University of Alberta. I'm really also very proud to say he's a mentor and a teacher of mine, um, especially in recent years, he's been very generous in his research mentorship. John Paul Himka received his BA in Byzantine Slavonic Studies and PhD in History from the University of Michigan in 1971 and 77, respectfully. He is the recipient of several awards and fellowships, including the J. Gordon Kaplan Award for Research Excellence. We invited him to participate uh, in this project, especially because of his most recent research, including field documentation of Ukrainian churches on the Canadian prairies many of which are no longer operating regularly due to the movement of farm families to larger cities. The talk is called Ukrainian Churches on the Canadian Landscape, Histories and Communities. 
The sanctuary project photographed the vast majority of Ukrainian churches in Alberta and Saskatchewan inside and out. The project team, of which him goes a part, also collected the histories of these churches. I had the great pleasure of joining them one summer. It was illuminating and really a moving to, to witness in these churches the stories of families for generations. Tonight's talk explains some of the features of the prairie churches and connects them with Ukrainian churches elsewhere in the Americas and with a history that goes back hundreds of years in Ukraine and even further back to the Byzantine Empire. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Paul Himka. So, thank you very much, Marcia. Can you hear me? Is it coming through? We can. Through? Okay. You know, um, I'd like to thank the uh, Center for Sound Communities for inviting me to partake in this uh, Heritage Festival. Uh, and Marcia, uh, yes, we worked together on Sanctuary, which was really a, really a treat. And I learned a lot from you and uh, from the concerts you put on when you were here in Edmonton, and it was really good. And I'm really sorry that uh, you have experienced uh, such a terrible storm out there. And I hope that, uh, I hope that you do well in the future. Although I think climate events are just going to happen and happen and happen is my guess. So I will be showing you pictures taken while we were on the sanctuary project. And I'll uh, be sharing my screen. So I'm going to do that now and uh, share. But I have to get on, on this. Uh, hold on. We'll have to do this right. Slideshow. Oh, here we are. Slideshow. Slideshow. Ah. Okay, so um, I want to say how this project started, uh, the Sanctuary Project. In 2006, I believe, yes. Yes, in 2006, I had finished writing a book on Last Judgment's iconography uh, in the Carpathian region of Ukraine and, and uh, Poland and uh, uh, Slovakia and, and Romania. Uh, all that region with the Carpathian's interconnected icons. I finished that project and was looking for other projects to undertake and at the same time, I was made head of the religion and culture uh, program at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And then, like a bolt of lightning, in fact, literally like a bolt of lightning, uh, a Ukrainian church in Hilliard, uh, Alberta, was struck by lightning and destroyed. And I realized, holy cow, these, these, huh? These churches are, are disappearing. We must make an effort to at least record, record them before they entirely disappear. And that emerged, that um, initiated, oops, how come it's not going forward? Uh, the Sanctuary Project. So the main crew was uh, me. Here you see me. Uh, Natalka Kononenko, the uh, eminent folklorist, Francis Svaripa, the main, uh, one of the prominent historians of Ukrainians in Canada. And then my daughter, Eva, was like our logistics person. And then we had various volunteers and people we, we, uh, we worked with, great people. We had, we took numerous expeditions, you know, Alberta and Saskatchewan, over a period of, geez, 10 years. And we would go into a church, we would photograph everything, we'd measure so that you get some idea of the size of, of uh, size of things. We, uh, we, we took photographs of every item that we could find in the church. And in this particular picture, you see two outstanding uh, art historians from Ukraine who we were able to invite for a couple summers to help us. And uh, uh, Olesa Semchishin, uh, Kuzner, who's, who's on the left, 
Uh, she's a specialist in contemporary Ukrainian art. And the one on the right is uh, um, Roxolana Kwasiu, and she is a specialist on the older iconography. We learned a lot from those two. And, uh, and uh, Olesa managed to write a piece on uh, the Ukrainian church architecture on the prairies as a result of her work with us. But we didn't just do pictures. We didn't do all the fan just the fancy stuff. We went in there and dug in there in the vestry in the sanctuary, trying to figure out what all was there. What is in a country church? And uh, I think once we completely finished the project, because you know how it is, you never finish things quite on time. Um, I think it will be an interesting guide to the material culture of uh, Ukrainian rural churches. We took pictures of what kind of books and um, pamphlets they had in the church for various services. So you could, on the basis of our research, um, spend time and figure out what was the kind of configuration of uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, manuals for church services. Sometimes we came across nice little publications like this one that was uh, put out by the Ukrainian Catholic Metropolitan of uh, Hollis and Lviv, uh, Metropolitan Andriy Sheptitsky, part of his um, um, liturgical reforms. We could find those in the uh, churches. But we also worked with, uh, with uh, the Alberta Heritage Survey, which, which tries to keep track of all rural buildings. And they even had us uh, take pictures of the outhouses. And, uh, and we often had to visit them ourselves too. So we took pictures even of that. One thing I began to realize as we were working is that the Prairie Province is stretching from Alberta uh, Saskatchewan to Manitoba is the largest existing sphere of post-Byzantine sacral colonization. Like we're used, we're used to having Western uh, Christian monuments be all over the world. Yes, Cusco, Peru, not really different than what you'd find much elsewhere. Johannesburg, South Africa. St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, Cathedral in Melbourne, Australia. We're used to that. We're used to, we, we take colonization for granted. Finally, in Canada, we're beginning to make certain you know, realizations that yes, we're actually on land that was, that was by other people that we colonized. But the landscape in the prairies, uh, one of the features of it is precisely these uh, domed churches of what we would call post-Byzantine design uh, that have just dotted the landscape. Wherever you look in these places. It's something we take kind of for granted in the prairies, but actually it's unique in the world, that we have such a conglomeration, such a scattering of uh, churches on the Byzantine model. Some are very humble, like this one. And when we went into church, we found all kinds of interesting stuff. So the Volian Russian Orthodox Church, and as you could probably guess from the name, these were people who came from the Volin region of Ukraine. And they built an Orthodox church. And while we were there, we found one of the uh, uh, locals had, I have to crop this and get these shoes out of it, but uh, one of the locals had found, had been preserving this cross. And we ran across an old photograph of a funeral in this church. And if you see that cross, it is exactly the same cross which we found in our researches. So we've been able to, to find quite a bit there. This is the northernmost uh, 
Eastern Christian Church in Canada, North Star Russian Orthodox Church of St. Peter and Paul. Not very, very uh, Byzant post-Byzantine looking, but nonetheless, if you go inside, uh, that's where they hold their services. Now, Prince, I want to talk about this because it's so interesting. This is the first church the Sanctuary Project uh, worked on. And um, it's in Carvel, Alberta, not too far from Edmonton, and maybe a 45-minute drive. And this is the very first church we touched. And I was so intrigued. I, I just, as I said, I had written this book on uh, sacral iconography in the Carpathians, but I really didn't have a grasp, a good grasp of the iconography of all these churches out there in the rural areas. What were the icons like? So with great anticipation, I went into this church. I asked I asked uh, Helen, uh, our guide there, Helen Shaw, I guess, I asked our guide, I said, Helen, do you have icons in your church? She says, oh, yeah, we have icons. There's the icon. All the icons were like this. They were in frames. They were prints. They uh, had definitely a Western uh, Christian um, origin. This is the Holy Family. We found this in many churches, and you can find it all over. This is a Ukrainian church in Brazil. It has exactly the same icon of the Holy Family. So it was widespread. I went, by the way, to, a, we also did a, a trip to Pennsylvania for comparative purposes. Um, and I went to the Carpathian Russian Orthodox Church of St. John the Baptist, and it's very richly decorated. And then sort of off on a staircase is this print of uh, the crucifixion. And the priest poo-pooed it. He said, oh, that's, that's probably the first icon in this church. But it was the last trace of what had probably been much of the original decoration. The prints were so popular that painters, icon painters, trained icon painters, would copy them for their work. So uh, here... Uh, on the left, you see a painting by Peter Lipinski, which is completely modeled after a print of the uh, of another another version of the Holy Family. This time, with the uh, Holy Spirit hovering above. So, the prints were so important and so much shaped the tastes of people in the uh, uh, in the prairies that. The artists simply copied them. And Peter Lipinski could be a good artist. I'll, I'll come back to him later. This is by, uh, again, by Peter Lipinski. This is a print. And this is, and on the right is what Peter Lipinski painted uh, in Leduc, Alberta on the wall. Same, same image. This one also, this is the print. Oh. Yeah, this is from a print, and it's on the ceiling of uh, a church, and it was printed, nine, painted 1943 by Paul Zabolotny, a, a Saskatchewan artist. In Reno, Alberta, a place I'll return to, I found this print of The Last Judgment. And I had written as I said, a book on Last Judgment Iconography in the Carpathians. And I had seen several of these prints in Ukraine uh, in the churches, particularly in Bukovina. And in one case, I saw an icon that had been painted in um, a small hamlet uh, in uh, uh, Chenilty Oblast, small hamlet called Vivi's, uh, in which the artist, this was specially ordered, and uh, the, the church elder told me that they had specially ordered 
an icon of the Last Judgment for their church. And what the artist did was he copied major portions straight out of the print as late as 2000 AD. But in true Book of Indian style, he had more tortures. There's none in this one. And he had to have a naked woman being uh, uh, featured in, in, the, uh, in, in the icon that he painted. This, by the way, was very typical of Bukovina, which had uh, uh, grotesque tortures they like they had in their like Last Judgment icons, as well as sexual uh, sins. So the prints were a huge influence. They were cheap as borscht. This is from Providence Church Goods, which is run by Jacob Maidanik in Winnipeg. And in 1922, uh, you could get a great big print, 28 by 22 inches, for just 60 cents. 20 by 16 inches, 25 cents. So they were uh, 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 very, very cheap. Nonetheless, they seem to have been held in high regard and as you see, placed in these beautiful frames. This is a print from Heinz Creek. It serves as an icon in the church. Even though probably the print cost 25 cents, it was inscribed with a little plaque noting the donation by Caroline and Sam Sirnick. In uh, Mondaire, I found, Mondaire Beaver Lake area, uh, they were able to afford a painted iconostasis. But what they did, which is very clever, is they took all the prints that they had and put them up at the top of the iconostasis. Here in this church in Vagreville, a Russian Orthodox church, they took the prints that they had and made them into into uh, crosses behind the uh, altar space. Here's a print at the shrine in uh, Cudworth. This was a shrine in Saskatchewan where Ukrainian Catholics uh, uh, held pilgrimages, uh, annual pilgrimages. Now it's closed down. Now it's basically a storehouse for art. But why I put it in this picture is because there's an inscription too purchased through the efforts of the Children's Society 1929. So it was the kind of thing kids would save up to, for to buy for the church. And here's a print at the shrine in Cudworth as well. As I say, it became a kind of storehouse for old art. But uh, it has a detailed little inscription, the main point being this. The icon was brought by Rosalia's family from their homeland in 1901 and has been in the family since then. So these things were often treasured. Actually, if you could look in my room right now, you'd see a, one of the prints from these churches that I have for, of uh, St. Nicholas. I treasure it myself. These were prints that were sold worldwide. You know, they were sold in the Carpathians, they were sold everywhere. This is from uh, the uh, print of the Holy Family. And underneath the publisher has the explanation in French, Spanish, English, German, and Italian, which means that they were seeking markets probably, well, for sure, all over the world. Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, British Isles, wherever any of these languages were spoken, and even in places where these languages were not spoken, such as in the Carpathians. Well, they knew Germans maybe a little teeny bit, but mainly they knew Polish and Romanian, because they knew a language besides Ukrainian. So these were worldwide phenomena, cheap, but treasured. And they represent part of the process of early process of our lands, the Ukrainian lands, the Western Ukrainian lands being drawn into the process, uh, into the global uh, product market, uh, uh, commodities from around the world. These prints arrived at the same time 
has these colorful, colorful kerchiefs that the women uh, now wear and started wearing about the 1870s or so after the railroad was built and connected these regions with the rest of the world. Uh, we take for granted, for instance, the rice in the um, in our holopsy, our cabbage rolls. But in fact, those didn't come in until the 1880s because again, the railroad brought it in just as they brought in the kerchiefs and just as they brought in the prints. They're part of that commercial um, uh, drawing into the money economy and in, in, in the world commercial uh, system. Then, but I don't think it's just that. It's not just that they're cheap. Not just that they were the fashion when the immigrants came over. And not just, not just that the uh, immigrants brought them with them because they're easy to bring. But also because of a, I, I would say, something that goes back to the 8th and 9th centuries in, uh, in Eastern Christianity. And that was the terrible trauma of the iconoclast uh, controversy, which was in Byzantium, where icons were being destroyed, pictures defiled. Uh, it was a terrible thing. This is an illustration of the iconoclast, this heresy. You know, uh, uh, the Orthodox celebrate a Sunday of Orthodoxy. I think we maybe even, yeah, I think even, even Ukrainian Catholics do. Um, a Sunday of Orthodoxy when the restoration of images is commemorated. So this is a, uh, this is a picture from the Huldolf uh, uh, Psalter, one of only three illustrated manuscripts which come from the iconoclast period. And it shows the iconoclast destroying uh, images. They may as well, when they print the, when they destroy the image, they may as well be attacking the savior is kind of the meaning of this illustration. This was a terrible, terrible trauma for all of Eastern Christendom. Uh, the, you know, we talk, we look at our icons and we say, well, they seem to follow the same form very often. That is because this initiated such a trauma about images that original art was discouraged and retaining the same features of all icons was prized. So the idea was you use known images, often with historical roots that Jesus put his face on a towel and that's where we get his image, St. Luke. Uh, painted the mother of God. That's where we get her image. And you didn't really want to depart from it. Just traumatizing, seriously traumatizing. And, uh, and uh, in Ukraine, uh, many centuries later, like about 1500, 1600, around that time, there developed a intense veneration of the passion of of the savior uh of his of his uh taking up of the cross and of his mocking by the soldiers and and his eventual crucifixion and eventual resurrection uh you know i mean uh, vladimir putin attacking ukraine tries to say well it's all one nation but it's really not as we know but one of the profound differences is our religious culture. Ukrainian religious culture is unique. It has elements of hybridity. In, you know, it, it borrows from the West where it's situated, but uh, it's, it, uh, it also has internal developments that are extremely interesting. So I have to say, this is a bit more my theory than proven fact, but when the uh, their new services, the Pasir service, the reading of the 12 Gospels, and so on, that became very important in the uh, Lenten, uh, liter Lenten services of the, of, the, of the Ukrainian church. Uh, 
in their time developed a new icon called, um, well, called the passion icon or the Menki uh, Christove in Polish, the, uh, the um, sufferings of, of, of Christ. And, and this icon, which you often is just across the church from inside the church from the last judgment icon. It's a big icon. This icon is about as tall as I am. Uh, this icon became very important. And what it consisted of was all the scenes leading to the crucifixion. You can see if you you look at it, uh, many of these uh, known known scenes. So when this developed, when this desire to depict in detail, almost like a movie, as it were, of the passion of Christ, there would be images or scenes from the gospel that had not been uh, that had not been painted in traditional Byzantine iconography. And they had to do new, uh, new scenes. Rather than just making something up, which would have been very hard for an Eastern Orthodox or Eastern Catholic uh, Christian to do at that time, it would have been it was exactly opposite of the Renaissance, where invention was important. Here, tradition was important. So where they lacked Byzantine models, they took from Western prints. So uh, you see this print here of uh, the arrest of, uh, of Jesus. Well, it's modeled uh, in, this, in this fragment of one of the icons icons from Dolina in uh, in uh, Livio Oblast. Uh, this borrows, you can see, for instance, the uh, halberds uh, over here and the halberds over there and the embrace here. And anyways, it's it's clearly modeled on the Vietix, uh, Vietix, um, uh, um, uh arrest of, 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 of Christ. Uh, Therefore, they had an image which they could copy. They don't copy it exactly. That's not the way it's done. It's impossible to copy exactly, really, in our art forms. Um, but it was inspired by this. And it gave a kind of legitimacy to prints that, that, uh, um, that had Byzantine roots. Let me go, let me go. Oh, and I wanted to say that um, if you went to the library at uh, Kiev uh, Caves Monastery, Kiev Skopczarska Laura, in the library, they would have books and books filled with these prints, illustrated Bibles and other things, which served them as models when they needed them. So here's another example of the arrest of Christ, again, modeled on an example existing print. Here's one of my favorites, though. I have to share this one with you. This is the print. And this is the of the Last Supper. And what the heck? I think I'm making an error here. Let me just go a little further in my uh, okay. Here, here, you see a Lemko print from the village of Bortne. Most of the Ukrainian population is gone from there, but some are moving back. And this Ukrainian icon is based on this print. You can see the round dish, you can see the chalice, you can see the seating arrangements, the kneeling that's going on in the front. Uh, it's clearly a copy of this print. However, you also have the same print inspiring this picture of the Last Supper, which is in the cathedral in Cusco, Peru. And it was painted by a mestizo artist 
And he added to the Last Supper this particular kind of rodent that they like to eat down there and indigenous people like to eat in Peru. So this was common practice throughout the world, but I'm pretty sure in our case, in the Ukrainian case, it comes from the trauma of the iconoclasm, which was conveyed, and you can read all about it in the first chronicles, and the art that was very conservative, and therefore the models from the prints were considered traditional. And therefore, they, these prints in our churches are not so strange as they might appear. But there also is very interesting original iconography. Peter Lipinski, who would be copying the prints later, uh, has this very beautiful local interpretation of the protection of the mother of God. Uh, one of my favorites, kind of a crazy guy, uh, not Sitch, um, in 1921, painted these beautiful icons of the Mother of God and, and of the Savior. He was a strange guy. He used to um, jump around on a scaffolding, and he was uh, quite addicted to drink, and he was often even paid in moonshine or wine. Um, Ukrainian Catholic painter uh, uh, Theodore Baran, well, did so many churches, particularly in Saskatchewan, but also some in Alberta, flamboyant, uh, echoes of the modern. Uh, this is a local painter in uh, Alberta, Vasil Zalutsky, did a number of our churches. So there was also this kind of uh, uh, professional artists or people who specialize in iconogra iconography. This is by Stephen Mausch from 1930. Jacob Majdanek, he was a uh, uh, very famous, uh, he, he ran those, that Providence church goods store that I showed earlier where they were selling the uh, prints. And he was also the author of the comic book about Vujko Stief, you may be familiar with that. Find all kinds of things here. This is from the inside of a church which I showed earlier, the Spirit River DeVale Church in Alberta, the iconostasis was commissioned from Mount Athos and is installed in the church in what I have to say is almost the middle of nowhere. Uh, and there's the uh, signature, uh, the work of the brothers of uh, Ananias and St. Uh, Anne, uh, etc. 1970. Sometimes you go in these churches and you find painted icons from the turn of the century, like this one, which is Buko, from Bukovina. Either it was brought over or somebody who knew exactly how to paint like, like the Bukovinians did in the old country painted it here. I think it might be more likely that it was ordered, but there are a number of these across the prairies, these ancient, absolutely beautiful folk art icons. And this, I like this picture for a lot of reasons. First of all, I have no idea who the painter is, and neither does a better expert on, uh, on, uh, 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 on uh, Canadian Ukrainian iconography, uh, Sterling Demchinsky, he doesn't know. I call this artist Bukovinensis. Uh, if you notice, uh, like they often did in the old country, the icon is dedicated, is decorated with me medallions. So it's really an excellent, interesting thing. Let's talk about urban migration. Used to be, used to be, I'm writing a history of my local parish, uh, St. John's Ukrainian Orthodox Cathedral. And uh, at the beginning, this, uh, the people in the city it was a very small number of people who would who would be going to this church. And the main power of the church, of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, was in the rural communities. And I would say that until World War II, the rural communities were more central to the development of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian activities than were the cities. But after World War II, people began 
abandoning the rural communities and moving to the cities. And with it came this terrible neglect of churches. I'm going faster than I want just because I were getting to the end here of my time. And sometimes, more than once, we run into this kind of situation. This is what's left of the church on the outside, and this is what the church looks like on the inside. And we found vandalism, we found choir lofts that served as urinals. We've seen all kinds of desecrations as these lonely churches are left on the prairies. And especially, sad point for us is all the beautiful embroidery that we found that is now tucked in boxes with the flies getting at them and yeah, and the moths or other things. I mean, just look at the kind of things there were. So one of the churches we did was uh, in, in Reno, it's northern Alberta, way, way north, but the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Protection. Actually, they bought a high school and they put a church in it. Never finished it. Plywood's still there. You see the prints on the wall. But what's really spectacular in this church, uh, there was a, a Miss Siona, Miss Siona, who embroidered the, everything for this church. Just absolutely beautiful. Whoops. And it's all sitting there, going nowhere. We don't know what to do. Uh, we've tried to figure out of ways to repurpose all this embroidery that we found. We think of how many hours the women worked, how their hands uh, produced such beautiful art. And um, we're really at a loss. We don't know what to do. You need, you need some kind of rescue program. Anyways. I'm happy to have sh shared this with you, my uh, pictures. I'll stop the share, and we'll uh, we'll open for any questions that you might have to me. Thank you. Thank you for that informative and like really intriguing talk that you shared with us. Um, you know, a story so that people who aren't from Ukrainian churches can also understand the context better. Uh, but then you've shared with us also these exquisite treasures. Um, John Paul, I don't know if you can see me right now. I, see I can. You okay, so what we have in mind is that um, maybe um, Alex, who's a little taller than me, will kind of aim the iPad toward the person who has a question, okay? <laughs> so you can see who's asking. Yep, if someone has a question or a comment. Okay, over here. <laughs> <That's too close>. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, a question on the influence and the changes within the Ukrainian churches out west or across Canada, uh, influenced by the West. Uh, some of the iconography would not be considered purely Eastern because the faces became more cherubic and the, the colors are different. Uh, the positioning or the location of stations of the cross as on some of your photos, it was shown. Um, and so, is there a correlation between sort of the age of the community and how much the West has influenced how they practice and how they pray and how they celebrate? I'm not sure it's the age of the community. So let me start answering what I what I know, and then I'll I'll, I'll uh, speculate. I would say that the most conservative churches are the Orthodox churches that were um, founded, established by immigrants from the Bukovina region. 
they have fewer Western influences than anybody else. Uh, I also think that the further away you are, like in the far north, they seem to be less traditional. Now you can, I didn't show pictures of, you know, that painting on black velvet, mm -hmm. those uh, ones with Elvis. They also mm -hmm. have them with, 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 with suffering Christ in, in the churches as religious pictures. Uh, even in Russian Orthodox churches in the far north. Uh, in the age of the communities, well, I suppose that the earliest ones were primarily filled with those prints. And it was with time, uh, with time that they went back, and I use uh, in my air quotes here, uh, when they went back to tradition. In fact, uh, many things were traditional. And the thing we found over and over again was a kind of a tension between what people considered to be their tradition and what the priests considered to be their tradition. So the people would say, well, we bought these statues of Jesus and Mary, and they've always been in our church, and Father X says that they're not our tradition and we can't have them. Or, you know, uh, 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 priests will say, well, as soon as that donor dies, I'm going to dispose of what he gave us, you know? Um, <laughs> no, seriously, seriously. Because what is the meaning of tradition? Well, you can pick, you know, people go back to tradition. But what is that tradition? What, what tradition are you going back to? Are you going back to the kind of iconography that existed, let's say, after the 1920s with Modesto Sanko and others in their work uh, in Ukraine? Do you go back to the previous period in which classicism was dominating? Or do you go back to the previous period where largely iconography was, was, uh, was um, perhaps the word is, perpetrated by uh, craftsmen and saddlers and others, people who had just hands, to, you know, good hands to work with? Or do you go back to more, to the monastic traditions of the uh, 15th century, 16th century, or back to the medieval? You know, where's your tradition? Where do you pick it? So what happens is there's this kind of neo-Byzantine, um, neo-Byzantine, I would say, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm trying to find a nice word for it. Fashion. Right now, all churches that are painted, almost all of them have these kind of neo-Byzantine paintings, going to the neo palologian kind of style, which is the style of Byzantine art. Hardly anybody goes back to the tradition, let's say, of the uh, Lemko uh, churches, or all, for that matter, all the churches of uh, what was the Panamishal Diocese or Eparchy at one point. A uh, very rich flourishing of art, but it's neglected, and we go back to that tradition, which in fact was never our tradition of Paleologian uh, icon painting. So you know, I have a very kind of loose idea of tradition. I, I uh, think that we have a lot of traditions. We have hybrid traditions, and we have direct borrowings from, uh, from uh, Western uh, practice. Many people, older people, miss the rosary. Some of them, you know, in every church we went to, these rural churches, especially Catholic churches, uh, and Father, you'll know what, what I'm talking about. It's, it's the, we called it the cope. It, they used it for benedictions. I don't know if you remember that service. You, you're my age, so you should probably remember benedictions in the Roman Catholic Church. And they were in our churches, where there was an exposure of the Holy Eucharist in what was called a monstrance. Monstrances can be found in the closets of every old Ukrainian Greek Catholic church that you find on the prairies. So um, I would say when the church is renewed, they go to Neo-Byzantine, they go 
as it were, back, but really not back at all, to the tradition. But the uh, older churches, except for the Book of Indians, relied on uh, Latin print prints. I hope that I've answered that question. Maybe you want to respond or... Thank you for that. Any, anybody else? Anyone else? Oh, I see one. Hello there, Professor. Thank you very much. It's been most interesting for sure. Um, I'm just wondering, as you're talking about the icons now for time, it seems as though everything is built upon something else. And I'm wondering, are there examples throughout centuries where somebody decided just to go to the word itself and create something original? Uh, you don't find much of that in our iconography, no. Um, as I said, there was this kind of trauma and uh, original interpretations have not been welcomed in our churches. I remember I went to a church, I went to a Roman Catholic church with my mother, um, which had a is in 1960s, they put up a very modernist mosaic of Christ ascending. Uh, I've never seen something like that in our churches. I'm sure they exist someplace, but innovation was not the desired goal yet. Okay, so when I started this project, when I started when I started my original iconography project, the one on that ended up as Last Judgment uh, iconography in the Carpathians, I thought the problem with with with, uh, with with the way historians tackle Ukrainian culture is that they imagine it as forever being original, innovative, and they neglect that part of the culture which is imitative. So, for example. Um, uh, there was not a lot of original uh, Ukrainian writing uh, on religious themes until very late, until about the 17th, uh, uh, end of the 16th century, 17th century. Uh, those were the times. And instead, most literary production was uh, copying sermons, copying uh, uh, Bible extracts from existing manuscripts. So I was very interested in, in copying. I was very interested in icons. And I thought of these things as being relatively static. But even though they cannot actually innovate, as we understand innovate, which was so prized in the Renaissance and afterwards in Western art tradition, I found that constantly the icons were evolving. There was always some interpretation that found a little uh, 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 um, uh, found expression, let's say, in Serbia. Like in the Last Judgment icons, there is a, uh, and many of them, and some of them, there is an illustration of the tale of Yosef and Barlaam, which is a very obscure <laughs> Greek. Uh, tale based on a, on on, a, on the life of Buddha actually, or a Buddhist classic. Uh, anyways, a Serbian artist added it, added a scene from it to, to the icons in a manuscript, and that made its way, as did many Serbian products, up to our iconography. It migrated up, so all of a sudden, at a certain point, uh, something changed. But it was organic because somebody followed an earlier model. Or another clear example, a really interesting example to me, is in the icons of the Last Judgment, you have nations, peoples coming up for judgment, entire groups. Because if you read the Gospel, Matthew 25, you'll see that uh, 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 Christ calls up the nations by nation. And so, you know, traditionally in our icons, there were Jews, Poles, uh, Germans, uh, uh, Romanians, and others. All of a sudden, in the early 18th century, 
comics appear in these icons. These are uh, comics are a uh, uh, kind of Altaic, Turco Altaic tribe that is Buddhist. A very unusual group. Why do comics appear in our icons in the early 18th century? Well, that's because they were kind of discovered by us, by the Ukrainians in the 18th century when Peter the Great, or Peter the First actually, brought comics into, into our territories, into the uh, home region to fight, um, to fight in the Great Northern War. So those kind of organic changes, I realized that over time, you could see the development. I talked about the specificity of Bukovinian icons. Well, they developed a real interest in horrors and tortures and stuff. So things would creep in. But the kind of you know work that like a Michelangelo would do to rethink how the last judgment should be done, to rethink how the creation scene looked, we never did that. Thank you. These are incredible stories that are told through the icons, through the paintings themselves. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, if I don't see any other hands up, um, and I know that we're coming to the end of our time, but so I'm, I'm wondering if you would indulge us um, just in a two minute answer, if I may. Um, Sterling Demchinsky is scheduled to come here in May because there will Brilliant. be a festival. Brilliant. And he's going to walk people through the church to talk about the icons and the iconography in the church. <coughs> There'll be walking tours. And you probably know that Baran is the one who painted the iconography in the church. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, just to give people a little bit of a teaser, could you tell us something about Baran um, that would help us make this connection between all of what you've been talking about? And I know I'm asking you to do this in, in a brief moment or two, but um, I'm sure that you know these stories that you're telling us are so, so interesting that you'll you'll be able to share with us something really intriguing. Well, what, what's interesting about um, Baran um, is the style, because uh, Andrei Sheptetsky, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Metropolitan, um, he. Um, he had a large icon collection. He had a manuscript collection, illustrated manuscripts and other things. And he would hire painters to work with his uh, icon painting, with, with his uh, manuscripts and his icons. Uh, and one of them, Modest Sosanko, spent uh, a great deal of time uh, and then decided to paint uh, based on... based on... Uh, what he had found in the uh, collection of, of Metropolitan Sheptitsky. So he introduced motifs and other things like that. Except this was the 1920s, and he could not help but paint it in kind of what's called secessionist style, uh, which is with the bright colors and the uh, kind of arresting images, and Baran comes out of that school. So when you look at him, he is quite different from uh, some of the others. Um, but he's in a style which I call, which is known as, well, I call it the Ukrainian revival style. But of course, it's not a revival of anything. It's a, it's a new creation of a style of iconography. So interesting. Thank you so much. I'm just going to let you take a last look at our crew. And we're going to all say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And wish you a good evening. Thanks so much for starting off our talk series with such wonderful stories. Thank you. Good night. Okay. G good night, all. <laughs>